Disinformation continues to be a threat to Ukrainian sovereignty and is also targeted at Western democracies and allies of Ukraine. Around the world, aggressive information warfare threatens information security as well as social stability, especially in those states which Russia seeks to destabilize or coerce into supporting it. As we saw in the 2016 US election, it can potentially threaten the results of voting, place undue influence on voters' decisions and undermine democratic processes. We've also seen propaganda narratives used with great effect to delay aid to Ukraine over the last six months as well. Tackling Weaponized propaganda is more important than ever, with a slew of elections set to take place through 2024. And of course, if we look into the near future, the advent of exponentially uh, increasing fakes created by AI. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe and definitely comment on the videos if you like our guest speakers. Please do also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. Many of them are involved in helping servicemen who have helped Ukraine to stay resilient and free, and they now deserve and need our support. Stas Olinchenko is a content strategist and writer focused on Ukraine, media, and tech. He is the writer behind the Words War newsletter, which focuses on undoing myths about Ukraine. And today we are going to tackle many of those myths and, of course, the weaponized his historical myths that Russia creates in order to support its internal and external propaganda. Stas, welcome to the channel. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for having me. And yeah, I'd, I'd like to start by again saying that, uh, you know, thank you for for all that you're doing. I think your uh, channel is becoming this huge library of, of insights. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's it's it, it is it is important. And uh, perhaps when I started the project, I didn't quite realize uh, really that there was so much to cover and how important these topics are. But I think it's it's becoming clearer to a lot more people. And the trouble, though, is no matter how many videos I produce, um, there are always more examples of Russian uh, messaging that somehow gets into the media, gets into the academic uh, bloodstream of dialogue, uh, and also, unfortunately, informs foreign policy discussions and decisions. And I think we both decided that we're going to start this off by talking about an article produced by Sergei Radchenko and Samuel Charup on the Istanbul talks. And what really got me about this, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of let you do majority of talking, but what really got me about this article was the normalization and the whitewashing, and one could even say the weaponization of Russian narratives uh, around the idea that somehow it is a credible negotiation partner. Um, but could you give us a bit of a, a breakdown of the article and why you think it's so dangerous? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like all, all of the things that you say are, are valid. I think it, it's it's uh, like we can only speculate about the intentions of uh, Rachenka and uh, Cherub. Uh, but it's clear that they they have an agenda and it's clear that they wrap all this you know intellectual talk uh in in actually you know russian narratives narratives that are produced in russia and exported in russian uh, so for instance like this whole idea that the istanbul negotiations in 2022 there were genuine negotiations that could have led to a true peace uh, that would be beneficial for uh, Ukraine, for democracy in the world. It's, it's, it's just not real. It, it never was real. And um, yeah, this, this has been from the start, the, this narrative that was uh, pushed by uh, Russian propagandists, uh, paid or just useful idiots. Uh, precisely to kind of distort our idea of what happened uh, in spring of 2022, uh, who is to blame and, and like what, what, what the lessons from, from these talks are. And yeah, I, th I think um, one of the most like toxic ideas that, that 
that they kind of touch upon. Again, like the 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 most dangerous part of their article is that they're not they're not Kremlin propagand propagandists like in in the genuine sense. They're not uh, people who you see, read, and you realize, oh, okay, they're just like pro Putin, uh, you know, hawks. They're not. Uh, but the the kind of wording that they choose, the kind of angles that they choose to pursue is is very telling, I think. Um, one of them being is that, uh, okay, so like if, if we start from the basics, the Istanbul uh, talks, they were nothing more than Russia trying to make Ukraine capitulate in, in like a legal way and internationally, you know, uh, in a way that would seem legitimate in the eyes of international law. You know, we have an agreement. Uh, it's, you know, it's signed by both Ukraine and Russia. So let's just move on. And th this attempt failed just because Ukraine managed to resist successfully and because uh, Ukraine's Western partners managed to kind of get their act together and, and started to actually help Ukraine with weapons that made a difference on the front line. And so Ukraine was not pushed anymore to accept this total defeat and, and, and sign this agreement. Uh, again, which was not finalized, but it was it was going in that direction. Basically, if it succeeded, and again, the, the whole idea of capitulation agreement succeeding by you know an invaded state just like accepting uh, the invaders is is just insane. Like, what what's the success rate here? You know. So, uh, yeah, like if if we start. Uh, trying to to uh, look for for more you know explanations of what happened there why it happened it's it's okay to kind of dig into it but it's also important to al always have this uh perspective on this event like what it, what it actually was what these talks were about and and uh Charup and Rachenko, I think they uh again they distort this uh, general view of these talks. They they try to um, hint that, well, maybe this was a genuine negotiations attempt. Maybe there was some kind of peace that we all lost for some reason. Part of it is maybe the West uh, to blame. Part of it may be uh, Ukraine. Part of it, of course, of course, Russia. And that dilutes um, that dilutes culpability, doesn't it? That's saying, ah, oh, well, you know, okay, the invasion was wrong, but actually, poor Russia is 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 partly the victim of this because they had, you know, they had some good intention there, some genuine intention, uh, and they proposed a a realistic solution to uh, the war, and, and that dovetails, doesn't it, with the idea that well, NATO provoked it, and if you think NATO provoked it which of course is nonsense and if you think that russia tried to negotiate in good faith then somehow you're diluting what what actually happened um but you mentioned charops um well normalization of what essentially was was not a genuine process it was a a rubber stamp to 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 try and give some you know, credibility or international credibility on what was an entirely illegal uh, war. But Sharap also wrote an article uh, around the time, uh, I think it was, of that negotiation. If not, uh, uh, I, I need to check the dates on that, because around this time, he wrote an article saying that Western weapons wouldn't make any difference on the battlefield at all. Um, yeah. So you can see a sort of pattern emerging there of... Uh, Diminishing the idea of of resistance against Russia as as, as 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 something that is credible, and also trying to to put uh, I would say more validity on that process than than it actually had. Yeah, definitely. I think the article you're talking about. I think he uh, published it even uh, earlier. I think it was like January or February 2022, but like it was right before Russia invaded. So he made a point, uh, like, trying to say that, you know, don't even consider sending weapons to Ukraine, it will not, like, make any difference. So let's just, you know, not even talk about it. So it it, it already, like, shows his 
beliefs, I guess you, you can call them, uh, his agenda. Um, yeah, and, and I think in in summer of, I actually don't remember, maybe it was uh, 22 or maybe it was already 2023, but he also wrote an article, uh, I think it was named something like the case for negotiating with Russia. Um, again, like we've seen at that point, Russia has been, uh, you know, still trying to conquer all of Ukraine for more than a year. And there has been no, no proof, no empirical evidence of Russia uh, being open to any negotiations or respecting any other uh, agreements that it had about Ukraine and with Ukraine. Uh, and, and so, like, I, th I think it's about the timing uh, of, of these articles and also the intention, the, the, yeah, the main intention, like, why would you write these materials? What's your goal? What, what do you, like, who uh, do you want to persuade? And what do you want to, you know, what's your message that you're conveying? And Cherub has been terrible on all of these aspects uh, yeah. since before the invasion, I think. And there's there's three options, aren't there? And we're going to deconstruct some of these. Uh, you've 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 sent me a a really interesting sort of thesis about the sort of um, I would say sort of the deep level and the, and the sort of shallow level of Russian propaganda, and also the differences between internal and external. But if we look at Charup, there there are there are three assumptions we can make here. Either he is epically wrong about everything and just it, he's just wrong but continues to be published despite his epic wrongness and that that and, and, yeah and promoted i, I think he recently promoted. was promoted so yes. yeah so fail upwards i think is the phrase there so if we're going to be the most charitable he's he's just epically bad at analyzing stuff and predicting it and yet as you say gets a, a lot of, it gets a big platform for that so that that that's that's the most charitable explanation the next explanation is that somehow um people like him are paid or have compromat on them and we have no evidence at all so we're not sued we have no evidence at all that that is the case he was however i believe a member of valdai which is the valdai discussion group and not everyone who was part of that uh, forum uh, has necessarily gone on to be problematic, but uh, some clearly have. And uh, if you spend a lot of your time, um, I would say, in Russia, in those circles, well, I, I mean, the, the chances are you will be at least approached by some kind of intelligence service. I mean, I, I rather suspect as students, the same thing happened to us and we were nobody with, with no influence whatsoever. So it, it's quite a good assumption there. The third is that there may be some other reasons that are very difficult to divine, but that these people know exactly what they're doing. They know that they're wrong, but they're putting forward uh, these points of view for a strategic purpose. Well, before we move on to the next topic, I think it's important to, to analyze the strategic purpose behind all propaganda narratives because they're not just put out there um, you know, for the fun of it. It's an expensive process of crafting, uh, distributing, and then amplifying uh, propaganda narratives. So you don't do that unless you have some purpose, just like you don't invest in advertising unless you have a product to sell. I mean, it's a similar kind of principle there. So what could be the benefit at this point of trying to create the impression that Russia is a credible negotiating partner? Yeah, uh, before that, I, I just wanted to say that I, I think uh, Charup is, I mean, I mean, it's just one person, but he's very symptomatic of the the approach that Russia has to uh, like spread in its, its narratives. And it, I think it's, it's like his case is just, just one case in a wider pattern, in a wider picture. And I think a lot of people in the West kind of refuse to see this picture because for them, this is like a, you know, Cold War type of story. You know, everybody is a spy. Everybody has an agenda. There's a lot of covert, you know, actors. And and I think a lot of people see it as kind of this uh, almost a joke, an outdated joke. And what many of these people fail to understand is that Russia has not moved on from these methods. And if anything, they have only improved how they work with uh, informational warfare 
uh, with the narratives, basically. Uh, so yeah, and and about uh, the thing that you said, uh, the, the question about the the end goal. Um, well, again, we can only speculate, and a lot of things that happen on the front line in in Ukraine will determine what's what's the political process is going to be. Uh, but it's obvious that Russia is, uh, I think it is trying to prepare uh, Western audience to this idea that maybe a bad peace deal is still better than this, you know, forever war, uh, which is, again, is not true, like for almost anybody living in a democracy, a bad peace deal in Ukraine. Well, it wouldn't be even a peace deal. I, I think it would just mean, you know, a ceasefire uh, until Russia feels comfortable to reinvade Ukraine. Uh, but this kind of deal would be catastrophic for, you know, security of people living uh, in democracies. And it, it would basically put in question everything that has been done to support Ukraine and its resistance for more than two years. And, and I think Russia is right now like working towards this, creating this fundament to, um, I think to, to help uh, to make uh, Western audience kind of play with this idea that, that, you know, maybe it's not as impossible as we were told. Maybe Russia can be trusted at least at some point. And maybe, you know, all this dying is, is much worse than whatever, like however the however bad this uh, deal would be. So yeah, that's again that that's just speculation, but I think that's the direction they're they're aiming at. And there's another example, I think, if you look at the uh, Minsk Accords, which again there are there are quite a few Russian commentators who and and propagandists who laugh at the idea that uh, you know the the Minsk Accords were genuine. You know, they were a, a strategic uh, ploy by Russia to prevent uh, Western countries from supporting Ukraine, providing armaments, uh, and of course they could use those pseudo negotiations they are but if you provide uh you know lethal weaponry then these negotiations can't happen and you're going to jeopardize and destroy the process so it's possible it's entirely possible that they fear a new avalanche of western weapons late of course provided incrementally far later than they should be uh when ukraine needed them nonetheless there is about to be i think a deluge of of new weapons and capabilities um, targeted towards Ukraine. Maybe this is an attempt to to try and um, put some validity on past negotiations, and then threaten and say, "Ah, but if you do this, then then these these sort of you know we can't negotiate with you if you do this. You'll have you'll have destroyed any chances of peace. Not us." Again, it's a sort of um, projected victimhood kind of strategy. Yeah, for sure. And and I think it's important to realize also that they're not pursuing just one narrative at a time. It's not that they that they have chosen this kind of negotiations uh you know narrative and, and they're like doubling down just on it. They're at the same time spreading many other uh you know ideas and narratives and just lies. Uh some of them may be controversial, uh some of them may not even, you know, uh create a, a consistent worldview, uh, but their their aim is the same. Like they uh, undermine uh, the West's support to Ukraine and they try to stop or delay uh, the sending of weapons to Ukraine. Uh, like just a couple of days ago, ago I think uh, there was a hearing in the Congress and Marjorie Taylor Greene, she went uh, to present uh, Professor Timothy Snyder uh, who is a you know one of the most respected uh, experts on Ukraine and, and the history of our region uh, in in the U.S. Uh, so he she presented him with these like facts that you know there are Nazi people in Ukraine. So I guess this means like we uh, U.S. should just stop supporting Ukraine, which is a very old you know propaganda. It, it has been you know. Uh, I think it, it was like the, the most popular narrative that Russia pursued in 2014 uh, when it started its aggression against Ukraine. Uh, but then I think 
since 2022, this narrative has gotten more like it was pushed to the fringes uh, because it became much more evident and apparent that it was just not true. And whatever Russia was doing, it was not because it was afraid of far right movements in Ukraine. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think all of these. Um, yeah, but we just have to remember that there are many narratives that Russia pushes onto us at the same time, and they may not even uh, seem intertwined, but they all uh, have a shared goal. Mm. And it's it's much easier for a narrative to be effective uh, if your goal is is very you know aggressive and harmful if you don't try to create something if you don't try to strengthen the alliance but you try to destroy it and you try to spread hate it's 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 just much a much more potent you know emotion to uh to amplify it yeah and of course uh, in in your sort of uh, breakdown that you shared with me you point out and i think this is very important that russian propaganda is much more complicated than people realize of course you might sit there as an intelligent person and say well actually i can see russian propaganda coming it's obvious i can i can hear the narratives i can spot them but actually when you're fine tuned into this you realize that it actually exists at multiple layers you might spot certain layers of it but other layers are far more insidious um, and will percolate through to many people, even those who think they're immune to it. So what's your understanding of this multi-layered complexity to the propaganda? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as I said, I think it, like looking at it through layers is the most uh, like the most helpful way to, to study Russian uh, narratives and Russian propaganda because people, I think a lot of people assume when they hear Russian propaganda, they assume it's this, you know, deranged talk show by uh, Vladimir Solovyov, or you know, uh, Dmitry Medvedev just like tweeting or posting some absolute, you know, just batshit crazy stuff. But uh, this is just, you know, a part of what they're doing. This is the external layer. This is also part of it is internal propaganda. So it has other audience, uh, and and it's just partly uh, directed at Western audiences. Uh, but there are, you know, layers and layers and layers. Uh, and the deeper you go, the less obvious it becomes, whether you're reading just a genuine piece of, you know, uh, journalistic work uh, or, you know, a policy report or whatever, or is it actually something that has been produced and curated and, or maybe like whitewashed uh, by the Kremlin. Um, yeah, so beyond, I, I think we started from Cherub, but I think it's kind of one of the least obvious layers there are, because uh, I would say that it is one of the deepest levels of, of Russian narratives sort of penetrating Western discussions. Uh, because again, these people are uh, well-established experts uh, the White House, you know, listens to them or at least recognizes them as as experts. Uh, and and these people don't necessarily say that Ukraine is, uh, you know, doing something wrong or that the West is wrong. Uh, they don't say that Russia's invasion is justified. So, like, it's it's much harder for somebody who is outside of this Russian narrative bubble to read it and and instantly spot that something's wrong you know something's fishy mm, yeah but between Solovyov and Sharp I think there's a whole lot of layers with uh, that, that are intended to target different audiences that are intended to mm, spur like that, that are that have different levels of complexity basically it can be something wild or it, it can be a you know stupid post on social media but it also can be a pretty uh you know long deep dive uh in a respectable journal and yeah so i and, think the, the yeah, yeah, yeah go yeah. ahead go ahead go ahead no no I, I just wanted to say that i think the the best way for us to kind of spot it is to learn uh 
learn to read these texts uh, efficiently and learn to spot these wordings, these kind of constructions, these maybe biases that are expressed in, in text. And, and if we do spot them, then maybe we should, you know, take a look at who wrote it, uh, why they wrote it, and, and so on. But I think the, the, the evidence is usually in the text that we are, you know, analyzing and reading. And that's, uh, I'd like to dig into that because, I mean, you and I, um, on a professional basis, sort of do this all the time, the deconstruction of texts, the parsing, the semantic parsing of texts to try and find out patterns. And of course, one of the key parts of marketing, um, as well as it had to be say, uh, you have to say as well, is religious texts as well. Uh, one of the key tricks to get people to absorb an idea, to internalize that idea, is also repetition. And that repetition may use different terminology, different formulations, but it's the repetition of an idea. Um, how does Russian propaganda use this? And how does it create uh, what has been called the polyphony, which is to present that idea back to you through multiple voices, multiple personas, multiple platforms, to the point where it starts to seem like an organic rather than a manufactured idea to the audience yeah i think you're you're completely right it is it is about repetition and it is about repetition of the same sort of ideas and 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 narratives but uh through through different uh channels through different people uh and you know th this whole idea is to gradually uh cover as many institutions and people who are uh you know, from deranged lunatics to respectable institutions to create sort of illusion that this is a, an organic idea, this is an or organic discussion that we're having, that we're not made to to talk about Ukrainian Nazis, you know, it's, it's a genuine concern that we're all having. Um, yeah, I think one of the, the most dangerous aspects of, of this work is that uh, most of the times we just don't know if a person is just a useful idiot or are they on a payroll uh, and maybe they have a connection to, to the Kremlin. Uh, maybe they're even, you know, they're just spies or, or, or uh, connected to, to Russian uh, special operations. And so if we go around and just point to all these people who seem to be, seem to have pro-Russian biases uh, and start shouting, you know, you're, you're all Russian agents, uh, then we risk to be seen as these crazy people who are obsessed. Uh, so this, this sort of like distortion of uh, who's saying what and why and this is one of the most dangerous aspects of, of this network of uh, propaganda spreaders, because at, at some point, and I think we've reached this point, uh, you just see a lot of discussions that seem genuine, that have genuine supporters, even of like among people living in democracies. Uh, but these discussions have been manufactured artificially uh, in Moscow. Or, or by Moscow. So like at this point, in, in some of these cases, it's just too late for us to, uh, you know, stop them from spreading. We can just, I, th I think the best thing that we, we can do is untangle them and, and try to understand, okay, like how do we just shut this discussion down? Because it's, this is not a genuine discussion that we're having. And one of the one of the think the, the strongest uh, narratives is not necessarily that Russia is correct and Russia is right, although I know that is used on, say, the evangelical community in the US, uh, the idea of Russia being moral and somehow superior works in certain communities, but it but it's it's just got a limited scope. Um, the idea that, that that is then used in people who may understand that Russia is 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 not uh, a sort of noble and uh, you know uh, benefit to to those countries and territories it conquers, um, they use the argument that yes, of course Russia's bad, but it's also invincible and it's eternal and you stand no chance. This seems to be a narrative that is used across the spectrum 
from the useful idiots to those who are, uh, you know, right at the extremes of narratives, all the way through to those who are considered, I would say, um, reputable uh, foreign policy experts, inverted commas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's that's the thing. Russia doesn't need to uh, to convince everybody that that it's right, that it is the force for good in the world. Uh, but what it like, it it's enough for Russia just to make sure everybody thinks that you know there are no there is no right side here. There is no, you know, morally correct side here. Everybody is on their own. Everybody is pursuing their agendas, and uh, you know, basically, this is this is a sort of nihilism that that they try to uh, spread, especially among the people living in democracies, because for them, uh, this means that you know, people will stop believing that democracy is. In any way better uh, than you know dictatorships or totalitarian states or fascist states, um, and and that is that is how Russia becomes stronger in in international uh, on the international scene uh, because you know if if there is no strong pro democratic alliance against Russia and currently we're we're talking about Ukraine so like this is this is the main sort of literal battlefield uh, of, of this struggle, uh, if you don't have a strong sense of uh, you know, unity among people defending democracy, then it's just much easier to for dictatorships to corner each state at once, take them at once, expose their vulnerabilities, and, and, and work them through you know, one by one. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what I think they're doing. It's it's a very that's that's actually something that I've written about recently. That it feels uh, increasingly similar to um, tackling fossil fuel propaganda, because uh, oil co corporations they often don't need to like they don't need pe to convince people that uh, you know oil is superb. Nothing's wrong with oil. Uh, let's just, you know, uh, yeah, so like they, they don't need to, to make this argument to succeed. What they should be doing and, and they're doing uh, is try to convince people that all this green agenda is just as bad as oil. Uh, nobody is right. We shouldn't change anything, by the way, in our economy. Let's just move on. Let's just, you know, accept things as they are. And yeah, it's it's very similar to what Russia is doing. And part of the reason is that Russia has been one of the architects of fossil fuel propaganda as well. That's right. And, um, you know, this 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 may trigger a few people in the audience, but there is evidence pointing towards the weaponization narratives during the uh, COVID pandemic as well, um, originating from Russia. Now, of course, that's not to say all of it came from Russia. It's not to say that there aren't genuine concerns there but certainly uh you know russian russian methods there's foot there's fingerprints uh on on some of the uh, weaponization of conspiracy theories that we saw there and i think that's an interesting one to pick up on because we've been talking about the more um uh, i won't say rational because we know that they can fact be factually disproved but we have been talking about the more sort of rational um ways of 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 arguing uh, in propaganda uh one would assume to convince people uh who can fact check who who can uh potentially think about the information they've been feeding but a key part actually of uh russian propaganda both internally and externally has been to weaponize conspiracy theories and, and those would seem to be absurd to many people who sit outside of those and historical mythology which again to those who are not uh, exposed to it, let's say from from childhood and so on, would also seem to be utterly absurd. So, what, in your view, is the role of weaponized historical mythology and conspiracy theory within the uh, within the Russian uh, methodology? Um, well, I, I think they're very potent in in a way that it's just very hard to disprove them. <laughs> 
to and you know fact checking against propaganda it just it doesn't work it doesn't really work like th there is a very limited uh you know success that you can reach by taking all of these uh, narratives all of these claims made by prop propagandists and you know fact check them and and rationally explain to people why they're wrong and what's like the the actual data that we have uh, this just doesn't work and uh yeah so like the, the only way you can you can tackle these sort of narratives is you have to shut down these discussions entirely or you have to deplatform people who are hijacking these discussions and this is extremely hard especially in democracies where there's such thing as freedom of speech. So I think Russia is uh, abusing this, this feature of democracy to uh, just hijack our discussions and install all these multiple conspiracies and uh, revisionist myths. And just because, you know, again, if, if you repeat all these lies in, and pack them in different forms, and, and keep throwing them at different communities online and offline, uh, they will start, you know, sticking in. They, they will start uh, to, to have an impact after some time and after you spend some money. Uh, and it's, you know, we've seen in the last 10 years that it's extremely hard uh, to tackle these uh, basically information warfare methods uh, using, you know, standard democratic procedures and methods. Uh, that's, that's, I think, why Russia has been so effective at it. Uh, the next area to focus on, I think, um, is... Uh, give me two seconds, uh, just to think. So one interesting point you made, and I really, you know, struggled with this at the time when the article came out, and that is some of these deeper level more slightly more subliminal uh russian narratives and one you point out i think which is really interesting is the controversy the manufactured controversies around volodymyr zelinsky and when you see articles about that including the one in harper's magazine earlier uh, last year about the the tragedy of volodymyr zelinsky and i think there was another big piece in time as well um they do seem to create the impression of um, uh, victimhood, I think, is is one. Um, and these aren't qualities actually I associate uh, with Zelensky or his speeches or his rise to fame and fortune. Um, it's, it's the opposite of victimhood. But many of these articles do seem to uh, warp or change the perception of Zelensky. And one wonders what the point of that is so you've been following these what do you think is the mechanics behind these kind of articles why do they get published and how do they potentially influence people in a way that is advantageous to the kremlin yeah that uh, that uh, article in the harpers i think it's a very clear example of, of these deeper layers because uh, the entire article it's it seems to be coming from a you know a good place, a, a genuine place of empathy. At least you you kind of get this read when you when you read the first paragraph. Uh, the author he's like uh, he recognizes you know Russian invasion of Ukraine as this violent thing, and and he talks about Ukraine's resistance and how Zelensky has been compared to uh, Churchill since then. Um, so it kind of starts from this empathetic point of view and i think that's where it draws in all the people who are again empathetic to to ukraine but not necessarily very informed about everything that's been happening especially before 2022 uh, and then like this article gently like pushes these people to suddenly uh you know claim that there was a civil war in ukraine since 2014 uh, and that, you know, there were these uh, rebel separatists that just wanted to break away from Ukraine, uh, of course, like with some Russian support, but like he, he actually uses uh, the term civil war uh, at some point in the article. And, and of course, then like 
he concludes with all this uh, idea that the West is also a, very much a, a party to blame uh, in, in all of this war. So I, I think the, the dangerous aspect of this is that it works with actually empathetic people, people who are not uh, you know, deranged, who are not necessarily the usual audience of Russian propaganda narratives. Uh, who maybe, you know, follow in some news, who maybe want to know more. And it creates a sort of mess in their head because, again, it throws in some of these narratives. It mixes them up with the uh, actually true uh, account of e events. And basically it makes all these people to question whether Ukraine is right in this conflict, whether you know, the West is right uh, in, in arming Ukraine and so on and so forth. And now I don't know why uh, publications like Harper's Magazines and others want to publish these, these sort of articles because once they do publish them, usually there's a backlash from Ukrainians, from Ukraine supporters and usually from people who know a thing or two about Eastern Europe, Russia, and, and Ukraine. Uh, so there's there's always this backlash and there's always this discussion of like, how the hell this was actually published. There's mm -hmm. so many manipulations. There's so many issues with this thing. And, you know, I unfortunately, I don't have the answer to this question. I wonder about these things myself. Uh, I don't know uh, the, the mechanics within these... Uh, you know, institutions, these magazines. Uh, but it's clear that something about their structure uh, makes them vulnerable for this sort of more complicated Russian propaganda to creep in because, you know, it, it is a pattern that gets repeated over and over again. Well, let's pick another one. And this is, you know, <laughs> when we were going to discuss this, and I've, I've been looking at some of his articles for a while now, and this is Simon Jenkins, who is a very uh, senior journalist within the UK. He has uh, been an editor on, on some of the leading uh, newspapers and publications. And I just had him down as a little bit of a, um, uh, how do you call it? It's a Russophile, uh, someone whose thinking is influenced by. But now I look through his headlines over the last couple of years. Um, it's an extraordinary array of, of Russian appeasing messages here. Um, and, you know, we've got uh, an article in 2017 uh, arguing that uh, Trump should get closer to Russia and it's a good thing. Um, after Litvinenko was assassinated, uh, he writes an article saying that uh, further sanctions against Russia would be pointless and hypocritical. Extraordinarily appeasing statement there uh he's written numerous articles in 2022 about how sanctions against russia are backfiring they're not working etc uh all the evidence is 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 to the contrary that actually sanctions have had an effect and are having an effect not as much as one would hope um but cancelling sanctions it's pretty obvious would simply bolster russia's war machine um rather than limit it so absolutely absurd uh kind of points of view here um article about the cancellation of russian culture being kafkaesque which is extraordinary in the context of how russia weaponizes culture i'm i'm, I'm talking a lot but i think it's important people see some of these um they are extraordinary uh he's arguing not to support taiwan uh and, and 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 let it to the mercy of china um he's arguing here that it's fine to cleanse dirty russian money from the city of london but it won't make any difference so extraordinary series of articles that essentially argue for inaction and i think that's one of the very powerful methodologies isn't it of russian propaganda is this one which you mentioned earlier which is you might as well not do anything because it won't make any difference and we're hypocrites anyway. So who are we to do anything or say anything? You know, we're all as bad as each other. These are classic Russian disinformation techniques. So as I look through these headlines, 
I become more and more suspicious of this writer, that this this is not accidental, that there is methodology here. Um further articles that arm uh, that, that that argue uh, that Britain should not rearm uh and articles uh that 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 talk about diplomacy and as we started this conversation that seek to show that uh, you know diplomacy is the only way forward whereas i think just about anyone in ukraine will tell you that uh, negotiations with Russia are, are neither plausible nor credible. And the last article, I will stop talking now, the last article here is accusing NATO of being reckless over Ukraine. Again, trying to argue for inaction uh, and leaving Ukraine to its fate. And in some ways, it almost implies that NATO is the problem and not Russia. So I know you've followed some of his articles as well. Um, what what are your thoughts there on the the pattern uh, of, 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 of the kind of uh, emotions and inaction that this writer seems to be uh, trying to induce in his audience? Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're absolutely right. Inaction is like the 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 main word uh like how how we can describe all this uh, strategy because again I, I think russia doesn't need to um you know uh, convince everybody to to support russia with actions uh it's it's just enough for russia to make a lot of people you know be be very passive and and not act uh, on in, injustice and and I think this is exactly the case. You're you're absolutely right. Like when you see a pattern of this sort of messaging, when you see that there's a pattern uh, of always, you know, criticizing uh, Western policy towards Russia or China, and always in with this angle of sort of we need to just you know just abandon these these regions, just like not interfere. We have to go easy. Uh, basically, just let's just do nothing, nothing and, and hope for the, for the better. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, as we talked, I think it's it's this layered approach. Some of these narratives are more direct and call for specific action, and some of them just uh, spread nihilism and and idea that nothing can be done or nothing should be done, and that that is perfect for Russia because again, if if arms to Ukraine are delayed or if they're you know stopped, that's just enough for Russia to basically conquer Ukraine and, and win the war. Um, inaction is a win for them. And about Jenkins, like personally, I honestly I, I don't know, like I, I haven't followed his like entirety of his career. I don't know what he wrote before that. Uh, I started noticing his agenda. Uh, I think starting with 2022, because I saw his articles on The Guardian, and I saw that he's consistently criticizing the West, but for all the wrong reasons, you know, uh, let's let's make our, the sanctions weaker, uh, let's stop supporting U Ukraine militarily, uh, let's uh, all together, you know, abandon this, you know, idea that, that we have to interfere. This is like... Again, if if we start walking around pointing at people and saying they're Russian agents, this this is just counterproductive. But when you see these these patterns, you have to question, you know, the integrity of the writer. And uh, well, again, the um, the goal of of their work, like what's what's their goal, what's their solution that they're trying to uh, to promote. And it will be interesting. Uh, you know, I know I uh, fervently believe that um, Russia will eventually uh, undergo a catastrophic defeat uh, in its offensive war. Um, it may not happen uh, soon or quickly enough, um, but it will be interesting to see what kind of articles these people produce um, when the evidence is there, when the evidence is uncovered. And when it's demonstrated that Western arms and Ukrainian skill and determination can actually triumph over Russia. And and when it becomes absolutely clear what kind of an entity it is, I, I fear that they will just turn around and find another angle 
because propaganda always pivots and finds another way to to package up its sort of lies and influence. But I'll give you the final word um, before uh, I say thank you. Uh, yeah, the, again, I, I totally agree with you. I think all, all these people, all these institutions, they will find another angle. They will try to, they will find another revisionist angle. They will, as some time passes, they will try to see what was wrong with our policy anyway, how you know we could avoid it, all of this. Basically, everything that we see, uh, you know, all these pro-Russian voices saying about um, post-Cold War order, saying that, you know, well, the West didn't treat Russia with respect, uh, NATO enlarged, and so, like, here's why we, we're having this these sort of wars in the region. Uh, I think it's going to be all the same. They will find an angle to uh, blame the West and uh, portray Russia as the victim. That's That's their job, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, and overall, again, I, I think it's it's super important to uh, not just to talk about every every piece uh, that we read because otherwise it becomes all all you know the noise on Twitter is just insane and and the discussion is often not very productive. But I think it's very important to sort of step back and see the patterns where they are. And, and see uh, what kind of ideas are pushed by certain actors and thinkers. And yeah, and make, make our conclusions and, and try to figure out, okay, like what can we do about it? Because it clearly is a problem and not just about Ukraine, not just about Russia, but about you know, the resilience of democracies in general. Well, Stas, that's an incredibly powerful place to end and a very uh, important thought to take away. Thanks so much for spending time on a uh, Saturday evening talking to me. Um, it's been incredibly instructive and we'll put a link to, uh, uh, you know, to your blog there and to your social media posts. And I strongly encourage people to check those out. But thanks so much for coming on the channel. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.